what did that look like? Like, I, I have this picture of you just hunkered in front of a screen and, and like five spreadsheets open at the same time, kind of ripping your hair out. Is that accurate? Oh, 100%. Yeah, okay. And once again, welcome to the Digital Customer Success Podcast with me, Alex Turkovich. So glad you could join us here today and every week as I seek out and interview leaders and practitioners who are innovating and building great scaled CS programs. My goal is to share what I've learned and to bring you along with me for the ride so that you get the insights that you need to build and evolve your own digital CS program. If you'd like more info, want to get in touch or sign up for the latest updates, go to digitalcustomersuccess.com. And if you have a question or commentary to be used in an upcoming episode, call us and leave a message at 512-222-7381. For now, let's get started. Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the show. Great to have you back. Got a good one in store for you today. Before we get into that though, I wanted to plug a Slack community which now exists called DCS Connect. Um, it is a community, as the name would suggest, all about digital customer success. It was started by uh, our friend and colleague, Marie Lunny, who is a digital CS expert. And over the past few weeks, we've seen a whole lot of um, new members to the community. And I'll put a link in the show notes and the YouTube description about uh, the community and how to join it. Um, so if you're interested in joining the conversation about digital, um, join us in that community. It's super fun, informative. There's lots of really smart people in there. And Maria is going to join us on a future episode of the podcast as well. For today, though... I have an awesome conversation with Michael Bojanski to share with you. He's director of customer success at Learn to Win and is also a recent recipient of a customer success excellence award, uh, which as we know is the, uh, the awards program put together by Alex Farmer, um, who might also be on a future episode of the podcast. Um, so Michael has a lot of great things to share and really, really practical advice about how to operate um, digitally. In our conversation, uh, we talked about what it's like to build uh, basically an operations function within a startup. He shared a lot of practical advice about um, the automations that he's building for um, pre to post sale handoff, some renewals workflows, and some, some other really exciting things that he's built super humble guy um but is uh just incredibly smart and loves to share and i hope you really enjoy this conversation with michael bajanski i know i sure did welcome to the podcast i asked you on the podcast because of well there's a ver there's a variety of reasons um you know you're, you're currently director of cs ops um, but but I think more importantly, you are a very recent transplant into the world of CS, and so I, I love having kind of a variety of folks on there who who have you know varying experiences outside of CS, and then that then then bring that into CS. Um, but you also recently were a uh, a winner of a CS Excellence Award, which is awesome, and we definitely want to dig into that. Um, you're very much an operations person. You're into uh, automations and integrations, and that's you know. That's the world of digital CS. So I uh, wanted to welcome you to the podcast, and, and I'm so glad you're here. Thanks, Alex. It's fun to be here. Yeah. Um, I would love to start with just kind of the standard kind of what's your background question and really what's your kind of CS origin story? What what was the circuitous path that brought you into customer success as we all have circuitous paths? And, uh, you know, what's what's kept you in CS? Yeah. So it definitely has been circuitous. I currently work at Learn to Win. It's a light learning and training software. Think of it like Duolingo, but you can create any type of content and then push it out to your learners. Um, so I've been with Learn to Win in a full-time role for about two years, um, all within customer success. I started working with Learn to Win uh, three years prior to that, so about five years total in part-time roles and had a whole bunch of different responsibilities from uh, spinning up our first chart of accounts with QuickBooks. And then I moved into a role uh, 
in um, marketing. So I was actually our part-time marketing director. And so spun up HubSpot, did our first email campaigns, uh, first version of our website that had, you know, good flow automations for, for funnels and things like that. And so definitely have um, touched a lot of different aspects of Learn to Win as it's grown from, you know, a couple people to now almost 45 and seed round uh, going on a Series A. So that's been a joy just w within Learn to Win. Uh, before that, I worked for a pre-med study abroad company in uh, an internal operations role. So finance, accounting, payroll, risk management, a lot of different areas. And then again, another operations role before that one where I worked for Amazon uh, in fulfillment center. So working uh, with in-person operations. So a lot of boxes, uh, people, staffing, things like that. Um, so the operations has definitely stayed with me throughout my career but have seen it in a lot of different uh, areas, such as, like I said, finance, accounting, marketing, and now customer success. I think that's so interesting because uh, I believe you have your MBA, is that correct? You... That's correct. So when I was working part-time uh, with Learn to Win, I was also doing mm -hmm. a full-time MBA at the University of Virginia at Darden Business uh, School. I'm curious because a lot of like startup founders and tech companies will say, you know, like going through uh, rounds of funding and eventual acquisition, but just building a startup from the ground up, it, it's a little bit like earning an MBA. And obviously, you know, there's there's differences between the two. But would you would you be would you say it's a it's a fair uh, statement to say you're kind of getting the second MBA uh, by what you're doing at Learn to Win? I think working at startups or earlier stage startups accelerates learning. I think it's a very com like a compressed stage. Um, when I talk to people in undergrad and they're thinking about, you know, like a very classic decision is it like, do I want to go into consulting or do I do <laughs> something else? Yeah. Um, if they have any, any whiff of an interest in startups, I usually nudge them towards startups because I have found it um, just an incredible learning experience and I've been able to accelerate what I've learned uh, much quicker so I think like one or two years in a startup is oftentimes the equivalent of maybe three or four years in a standard company um, I think an MBA similarly is you know you have you know two years for a full-time program of very compressed learning and you know you have finance accounting marketing all these different things happening simultaneously um, so I don't think they're quite the same in the sense of what you're getting out of them but I would both say they're like very compressed learning experiences um, yeah. and you come you come out of it with a much higher set of skills and you're you're able to do a lot more things more effectively yeah that makes sense um, and I also love the fact that you've um, you know your your previous kind of realm of responsibility was marketing because you know traditionally you could say that a lot of CS folks have come from a sales background or a call center kind of support background which is which makes sense on the surface and in traditional CS models but now that we're moving into a more kind of digital and automated world um, seeing seeing more and more and more and more people coming from a marketing and marketing automation background so uh, it's cool to, it's cool to see that um, in your career trajectory as well so yeah and I, and I think um, I think a lot of um, creativity or value can be derived from connecting things that aren't usually connected and so if you have different areas of business that you've touched such as oh I've worked in HubSpot and I know that you can have these types of workflow automations or I know it's standard practice to look at open rates mm. and you think okay well why don't we apply that same thing for some of the digital touch that we're doing in customer success and this is you know bread and butter for marketing but you know maybe that that same thought process isn't applied but if you've touched that area then you can bring that line of reasoning i think that goes for any type of career or innovation is usually it's people who are connecting two disparate things and yeah. then they're they're they come up with something really cool from that yeah, it is cool seeing those worlds of, of um, you know, metrics collide where you have, uh, 
you know, your traditional kind of like CSM type metrics and renewal rates and all those kinds of things, but doing that in conjunction with, you know, click through rates and all that kind of stuff is, is, is an interesting world. Um, you, you know, uh, one thing that I like to ask all of my guests um, who are on, whether they're directly involved with digital customer success or not, and in your case you are, um, is is just kind of the standard elevator pitch of digital CS. What what is it in your brain? Like, what is digital customer success? Um, and you know, the goal is to basically combine everyone's answers into a magical word map that you can view on the website. Love word maps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for me, I would say digital CS is utilizing software automations to enable customer success, people within customer success to do their jobs more effectively. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it replaces CSMs or replaces the need for some human touch, but it's going to make people more effective. Um, with all of the, the talk with generative AI and AI in, uh, in general, one of the quotes that stood out to me is that um, people won't be replaced by technology, but people with technology will replace those without technology. Mm. And I think it's the same thing with digital CS. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And is, you know, very much a cornerstone of where we're headed with CS and all the platforms are launching, you know, various tools to enable that. Um, your, one of the reasons I was very excited to talk with you is because you have this unique opportunity to build things kind of from the ground up. You know, a lot of digital functions are being installed on top of already, in some cases, decade old CS operations, and it's a lot of change management and things like that. But you're, you know, you're able to to really focus on, you know, some some key problems and some key issues and, and working with kind of systems and operations to, to, to solve those problems essentially from the ground up. And I'd love to, your, your, to get kind of into your brain a little bit about the approach that you take um, when implementing some of these things and operationalizing um, some of those solutions. Also, there's a garbage truck outside, so that's super fun for when you're recording a podcast, but just ignore that. Um. You are correct in that I, I was able to build things mostly from the ground up, which is a unique opportunity. I also was doing it for the first time. And so, you know, you get some benefits from, oh, I don't have to worry about, you know, what anyone else has done. But then I also uh, didn't have direct experience in, in building out a, a customer success platform or installing one. Um, so our CS team started in earnest, I would say in early 2021. And uh, that's when uh, Julie Odo, my boss got brought on. Um, and then I joined full time in August, 2021. And so it was my, one of my first main tasks was launching client success, which is the customer success platform that we use. And one of the, one of the things I would say about my approach is I am probably more thorough than the average person. And I would rather do it right the first time than have to come back later and clean something up. Usually, when doing any sort of big software install or you know spinning up a CRM or anything that has a lot of records management and you have existing records, the thing that's going to take the most time is cleaning your own data. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually take that much time to configure the software, but it's configuring the software around what exists. So we had three or four years worth of revenue data, and I made the decision that I wanted all historic revenue in client success. And that's what took the most time. And it probably delayed a, a full implementation by maybe two months. But I knew that was something that we weren't going to come back later and do, especially since a lot of this early data um, mm -hmm. was with relatively small customer contracts. We were working with high schools initially, and uh, it wasn't something that I was going to come back later. And so I wanted to do it right the first time. And so now, you know, two years later, we can look back at historical revenue data with a lot of accuracy. And when we have a question about a customer, 
we know that that customer will exist in client success because we have all historic records there. And so it becomes a one-stop shop and you don't have to, you know, be searching in Slack or in Google Drive for, for information yeah. on this relationship from two or three years ago. Um, so what, what did, I think if I can interrupt yeah. you real quick, what did that look like? Like I, I have this picture of you just hunkered in front of a screen and, and like five spreadsheets open at the same time, kind of ripping your hair out. Is that accurate? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. And okay. so, I mean, I was trying to figure out what do we, what do we use as a source of truth? And so I partnered with our accounting team to say, I want an export of all of your quick Quickbook, QuickBooks invoices. Um, and since this is, you know, what's getting reported on, this is, these are our books, let's start there. But the QuickBooks invoices don't always have contract dates associated with them. The mm -hmm. names that someone is invoiced under might not be the same name that we know them as a customer for whatever reason, you know, with high schools, sure. it might be because you're abbreviating things different ways. And so it was a lot of just row by row data combing asking context questions to different people who, who might know something about that account and then making some sort of judgment call. But yeah, lots of spreadsheets open, lots of, lots of hair pulling. Wow. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> I figured as much. Um, it, it, and is your, uh, so, you know, you, I mentioned at the outset that you, you recently, uh, were the recipient of a, of a, um, you know, CS excellence award. Congratulations, by the way. Um, that's, that's a really cool achievement. And, uh, first off, were you surprised? Like, did you go into that event kind of with an inkling or did you, were you kind of like, oh, this is awesome. I, I didn't quite know what to expect. Yeah. Um, when I had written the application, I, I spent a decent bit of time on it. Um, and then I had both my wife, who is an excellent writer, she's, she's getting her MBA and she's uh, also getting a master's in public policy. So she's a better writer than me. Um, mm -hmm. And my boss all both edit it. And so one, I think it was a very compelling story of what I had done. And uh, in, in quick summary, it was uh, using the tool Zapier to build out internal automations and integrations in different parts of our internal, internal tech stack. Um, so one, it was a compelling story that I think had a lot of business value. But two, I think because it was well written and there was some uh, story element to it that that flowed well, I, I thought that made it also very compelling. And so mm -hmm. sometimes you sit back and you're like, "Man, I wrote a good thing," and uh, at the end of the rounds of edits, I was I was proud of what I submitted. Yeah, you put some time into it. That's good. It's, it's a cool little snapshot too. Uh, you, I'm sure you'll look back at it in a decade or so. You'll be like, "Oh yeah, that's cool." <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, which does lead me into, you know, kind of my next question around automations, which is to say, like, what, what are some things that you've built? I think it's always useful for the audience to get a, you know, a, a look under the hood, so to speak of, you know, what are others building out? What kind of, you know, automations, integrations uh, are people building that help them either solve some customer facing challenges or cause some you know, internal efficiency gains with CSMs and all that kind of stuff. I'd, I'd love to kind of understand what are some of the fundamentals that you've built that you feel like would be applicable to anyone. Um, but then are, you know, what are, what are maybe some more innovative and out of the box things that you've built too? Sure. So three things that jump to mind. One is our process of sales to customer success handoff when a contract closes. Uh, the second would be some of our renewals workflow that uh, we recently launched. And then third, and this is a little bit more bespoke to us, but a process for helping the sales team as they request uh, assistance from the customer success team. So um, they have custom demo requests and we sometimes will build out custom content. And so how do we make sure that that process of requesting help from the CS team is organized um, and tracked effectively? So those are so, three, happy to, happy to jump in any of those that you want. So wait, you're actually handing information off from pre-sale to post-sale? Yeah, <laughs> wild, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, talk to us a little bit about that. What what does that look like in your world? Yeah, so for that first one, um, 
uh, our sales team uses Salesforce, um, and the customer success team is not in Salesforce, just because of licensing reasons. We, you know, earlier yeah. stage startup, Salesforce expensive. is expensive. So expensive. Um, and so there's not really a justification for someone to be in there just for kicks and giggles. Mm -hmm. um, so when someone moves an opportunity to closed one, then that's going to trigger a bunch of automations with the handoff process. So Zapier is one of the things that connects all of this together. And so when that closed one stage is selected on a Salesforce opportunity, several things happen. Uh, one is there's a Slack message that's sent to a closed one channel. I think that's pretty typical, um, but that gives a lot of visibility. There's celebration within that. Mm -hmm. um, two, that that creates an account within client success. And so that is automatically created. And so that's helpful that there doesn't have to be manual data transfer into client success. Yep. Uh, three, it triggers tasks. Um, for Julie and myself to make sure that the data is transferred correctly and that we're aware that there's this new client, there needs to be things done with them. Um, and then there are also workflows that are assigned automatically um, for, you know, here's kickoff and onboarding, et cetera. So a lot of things just on closed one opportunity in Salesforce, but mm -hmm. if that was all done manually, it, it wouldn't happen or it would happen and it would just be really messy or, Hey, can you remind me uh, about this information or have you created this yet? Um, mm -hmm. We know that if something is closed one, it's going to exist in client success. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Are you, um, how, how engaged? Okay. Let me back up some. So, so a lot of operators maybe have the tendency to kind of work on things in a bubble and not really socialize it too much and just kind of do some really cool stuff, implement it, but don't, you know, don't really socialize it and then have to kind of sell it after the fact or whatnot. Um, and I don't think you fall into that category, which is why I'm asking you the question of, of, of like, what kind of socialization do you do about the things that you're building, especially with leadership prior to like, how, how do you, how are you kind of project managing that? Mm -hmm. One thing that helps is that I, I'm a CSM myself, so I have a book mm -hmm. of business that I manage. And mm -hmm. so anything that I'm building, I'm also having to use. And so if it doesn't So you're work, your own beta tester, basically. I'm my own beta yeah. tester. I'm like, uh -huh. okay, if I if this closes and this notification doesn't make sense, then I'm frustrated. I'm going to go yeah. ahead and fix it. So it's nice to have agency in fixing the things or, or upgrading the things that you're utilizing. Um, it's a little bit unique to my role. So in my role, I, I have a book of business that I manage. I manage our support ticketing. And so that's its own vertical. And I have one, one direct report that rolls up under me. And then I do all of our systems management. And But having that first bucket of managing my own book of business and interacting with clients and seeing the implications of, you know, a field change in client success or, um, you know, changing how we do renewals that is a is fantastic experience to make sure that I'm empathetic with the the things that I'm creating and I understand um you know the end result for for other CSMs on our team. Yeah. There's there's a lot of folks who would say, you know, do it manually before you automate it, but I think you're you're in a unique position where you kind of automate it and see if it's broken real quick. It's like the SpaceX approach. It's like you build <laughs> it and you break it and then you make it better and you break it again. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think to your to your question about leadership support, yeah. my boss, Julie, uh, we have a fantastic working relationship. She's an amazing boss and she mostly just kind of gets out of my way and she trusts me. And I think she's excited that there's lots of cool and snazzy things that are happening that make the lives of people on her team easier um, and she doesn't have to worry about it. And then it's exciting for me because I'm learning skills that are going to be transferable to a lot of different things. And yeah. my, my medium term career goal is to be a COO co-founder. And so I want to be managing teams. And these are, these are skill sets that I think are going to be helpful for me long term. So I'm, I'm happy to take on a little bit of extra burden uh, to get those reps and to see um, what those motions are like. Yeah. while well, you're making her life easier. So that's cool. That's it's always, it's always good. good to make the lives of your boss, <laughs> the, yeah, the life of your boss easier. It's a good way yeah. for, for career advancement, for learning things.
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, I know we spoke a little bit briefly um, earlier this week, and you had mentioned also recently getting involved in the renewals process, which I think is interesting because, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's kind of steady debate as to where renewals should live and whether it's, you know, revenue team or CS team. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you have an opinion either way on that, but I know that you, you have gotten involved in the renewals process specifically with the, the intent of, you know, enabling um, everyone on the renewals process and being being involved in the in the change management uh, of that mm-hmm. and um, you know love for you to speak to that a little bit. Yep. So that was I, I think the the second category of automations that I mentioned. And so yeah. this was a a big project has probably taken almost three quarters to to fully flush out. Um, the majority of the time was was building all these automations and partnering with sales and accounting to make sure that you know the flow of uh, you know contracting and order forms getting signed and invoicing made sense. Um, to your point about who owns what, right now sales, if you had a spectrum of you know customer success to sales, sales owns a little bit more of it. Um, they they own any upsell conversations and then they also handle most of the logistics with like a simple renewal that's not changing year over year. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that's universal for every organization. I think different stages of business, different types of business. Um, So uh, I think you can kind of pick your flavor there. Mm -hmm. But at the end of this process, once we had all the automations built out and we needed to teach people, you know, what is this new process? What do you need to do? we're a learning and training software and so it made sense that we we use our we use our own software for this drink your we own talk Kool-Aid. about onboarding uh we talk about onboarding and, and change management as one of our strengths and so i built out a bunch of training in learn to win um and this is uh the the flow that we did was i assigned this training let's say you know june 1st and then one week later at our team meeting was when it was uh, due to be complete. So we had about five lessons and one quiz. And so people took this training. It wasn't um, super long. It probably took 30 minutes in total to to complete. And there's documentation that supports it. So I think there's a difference between documentation and training. Sure. Training is usually lighter. And the documentation is here's what you would go for if you really want all the nitty gritty, if you want to know, mm-hmm. you know, why this works or et cetera. So there's, those are two separate things in my mind. Um, but the quiz is, is really critical because I think a lot of times you'll push out training, but you don't really know where people's gaps are. Mm-hmm. Um, it's similar to one of the origin stories of Learn to Win is we actually started with athletic teams. And you think about uh, uh, an American football coach and they're training maybe, let's say, a quarterback and, you know, say, hey, learn this playbook. And then you want to know that that quarterback knows that playbook before the big game. Right. And so how can you figure out if they have if they're going to make a mental mistake before they throw a pick six? And so, this, you know, the stakes are a little bit lower of, you know, you want to know someone knows how to do, you know, a, a new renewal forecast. And if they do it wrong, not that big of a deal. But having that quiz in that learning flow is really critical. And so after taking the quiz and before um, we had this recap and debrief a week later, I was going through all of those quiz answers and looking and seeing you know, if a couple people got this question wrong, is this because, you know, they didn't study well enough or is this because I, as an instructor, didn't have good enough material or maybe I said it in a confusing way or maybe it was a bad question. And so that's on me versus maybe someone, um, you know, gets a 50% on the quiz. That's probably more on them because they, they weren't paying attention and they might need some individual coaching. And then the actual Uh, meeting, you know, a week later was a lot more about what did people find confusing? What areas can we still improve? And it had this flipped classroom methodology where you're not giving someone first look at the content in a presentation with slides. The classroom is for discussion, problem solving, working out examples. Um, And it worked really well. And so out of that discussion came you know, here are some areas that are a little bit confusing. We need a checklist. And 
you know, an easier way to remember all these steps. And so that was something we could build out in client success. And that rolled out two days later. Um, so I really liked this flow of having the learning happen asynchronously, have a quiz to determine where there's still knowledge gaps, and then be able to have that richer discussion uh, within a team setting. Yeah, I love your focus on internal enablement on these things, because I, I mean, <clears throat> so many times, and rightly so, we're, we're focused on the client experience, we're focused on client education, we're focused on outward things. <clears throat> but, you know, if we're implementing these kinds of processes and automations and whatnot, it's obviously unrealistic for our teams to just kind of understand right off the bat what you've built and what's in place and how it works and how you, you know, how the human interacts with the automation. Um, and, and so that's, it's cool. And it's also great. You can, you know, drink your own Kool-Aid and use your own <laughs> tools. That's, uh, that's good stuff. Exactly. Um, so what's, I, what's in the future? Like what, what, what does your roadmap of stuff look like? What are you, what are you going to be building at some point? What do you have your eyes on? Where do you think the big opportunities are for your org, but maybe also just in general? One thing that I've been working on this past month is, you know, I, I talked a lot about how I, I love to have good base data and be very thorough with it. Um, have regular motions for, for cleaning data. Um, it's now at a point that we have fantastic data and now we need to have more visibility on the reporting. And so this is something in the last month I've built out uh, a monthly report which has a huge variety of metrics and they're pulled manually but they're pulled from a couple different places but then I I aggregate them into you know one slide deck that I can post monthly. Um, it's more geared towards my boss and senior leadership within the company, but it has mm -hmm. things on usage, health, revenue, renewals, churn, ticketing utilization, things like that. Um, and so the next few quarters, I'm thinking about how do we now leverage this great data that we have and how do we now have actionable decisions uh, on on the on what we've sowed on the on the work right. that we've um, put in. Uh, I'm so envious of your of your great data, <laughs> as, as, <laughs> as I'm sure lots of listeners are. Um, what and some one thing that you mentioned just now, which I think is key, is is the data hygiene aspect of it, because I think no matter how you slice it, at the end of the day. There, there's human involvement in keeping data up, you know, up to date. Um, uh, and, and, uh, you know, it, I'd love for you to share any thoughts that you have about how to go about doing that. Is that like a, you know, a quarterly event where you, you know, you, you bring in refreshments and everybody goes and makes sure that all their stuff's up to date or, you know, are you, are you reporting on it, doing exception reporting, like that kind of stuff? Like what's, what's, where's your head at with regards to that? It depends. It depends on the scale that you're at, and probably the size yeah. of contracts that you're working sure. with. You know, if you're having, mm -hmm. you know, contracts that are a couple hundred bucks, and you have thousands of them, then that's going to be a much different problem than where we are right now, where our contract value is a little bit larger, and we might have, you know, you know, ten to forty contracts a month. Um, and so, because we have fewer, then I'm I still have a manual touch with every single contract. And I know what to look for in terms of what people are commonly doing wrong. Um, as one super small example, but I, mm. I think it's indicative, is we had a contract where when I stuck it in client success, it uh, it was like a nine-month contract, and it prorated what the ARR would be. So it extrapolated, okay, when this renews, and it renews as like a 12-month contract, it's going to be you know X, Y, Z. Um, and... Um, our accounting team had not taken into account that it was like eight months and nine days. Right. And so then that ARR calculation is a little bit different. It's not a huge difference, but there still is a difference. And so flagging that and saying, hey, like, what are we going to do this $1,000 of difference? Um, and then having a record of that and saying, okay, you know, here's the decision, whether it's a compromise or we just say, you know, accounting gets to win, gets the W on this gets one. Win, yeah. um, <laughs> but you know, flagging little things like that, and those add up over time. So when someone says, why is your ARR, you know, $100,000 different than accountings? Mm -hmm. It's usually made up of uh, a, a lot of little things. And maybe there's a couple, you know, big errors that are in there. Um, but 
I I would recommend having one or two people that really know what they're thinking about be be looking through it than saying, you know, good data is everyone's problem. It's true, you need to have good training that you know that's what the renewals training was all about. But yeah. usually you have a couple people who are a little bit sharper um, and they can be catching that. And that. Whether it's through exception reporting or, you know, having guardrails in place for pick list fields or whatever it is. Um, yeah, that, that would be my approach. That's great. Um, as we kind of start to wrap up a little bit, I would, I'd love to understand what's in your content diet. What books are you reading? What, um, you know, what podcasts are you listening to? What channels are you paying attention to? Yeah, uh, I love to read. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2019, I read 56 books, Jeez. so, uh, big reader, uh, have dropped off a little, but I think this year I'm at like 20. Um, so I like to read a, a, a wide variety of things. I actually mm -hmm. don't read that much, that many business books. Um, so I like a, a, a mixture of everything. Um, I just finished reading a book called, maybe you should talk to someone and it's a, a, a fiction book about a, a psychotherapist and her journey journey with therapy as she's also uh, giving therapy to five of her patients um, hmm, so that was more cool. of like a page turner but also made me think about you know my relationship with my parents my relationship with my wife like mortality sure. all these different things yeah, yeah. Um, and then I just started uh, the 1619 project um, as it's still you know race in America is still a, a very um, big topic and something that we should all be informed about. And so, yeah. you know, very different books, but I like to have variety. Yeah, that's great. Do you have cool. any recommendations for me? Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I mean, my, it's interesting because my, my diet, I fall asleep when I read. I always <laughs> have. Like my whole life, it's been a big problem especially in college, it was a huge problem. I got to just fall asleep. It just puts me out. Um, so I'm a big audiobook guy. I'm a big podcast person. I'm always listening to something on runs, doing the dishes or whatever. So, you know, there's um, Unturned is a great podcast. Been listening to, um, you know, quite a while. Lifetime Value is another really good podcast. i um, been listening to a while. One of the podcasts I listen to um, constantly is My First Million. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also into like zoning out, and not doing business stuff. So like a um, bunch of comedy podcasts, um, you know, like Smartless. And there's a show with uh, Dana Carvey and what's his face, David Spade. That's really funny. So anyway, it. it's it's all over the place. But yeah. Um, who would you want to maybe give some kudos to or call out somebody who in the industry who's doing cool stuff? So Christy, uh, who's the um, chief customer officer of Client Success, mm -hmm. um, she has been a fantastic partner. Um, we've been working with them for now almost two years and have seen tremendous innovation and development uh, with their platform. They've been just great partners for problem solving different things. Um, their uh, chief product officer, VP of product, um, JD, I don't know his last name, has also mm -hmm. been uh, great to work with. As we started uh, building out a lot of these automations with Zapier, I flagged that there were a few minor tweaks that could unlock a lot of value. And he was really happy to jump on with me um, for uh, me to walk through how I was using it. That was some of the uh, impetus for submitting the award was some encouragement from Christy there. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, it's been fun to work with a company that is so responsive to feedback. Um, and so yeah. that's been a pleasure. It's like, oh, like it would be so cool if we could just do this, and then it happens. Okay. And that is uh, that is great. <laughs> that doesn't happen, you know, if you're working with a Salesforce no. uh, you know, thing. Like, good luck. They can probably do it anyway because they can do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but especially with you know mid-tier software companies, it's it's cool to see that type of responsiveness. Mm -hmm. That's great. Cool. Those are awesome. Kudos. Um, and, you know, lastly, where can people find you? How can people reach out to you and engage with you? LinkedIn is the best. Yep. Always the best. Always the best. 
Well, uh, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. I really appreciate all the insight and the and the, the knowledge bombs that you dropped. And uh, I'm sure listeners got a lot of value, but uh, thanks for coming on. All right. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for joining me for this episode of the Digital Customer Success Podcast. If you like what we're doing, consider leaving us a review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps us to grow and to provide value to a broader audience. You can view the Digital Customer Success definition word map and get more details about the show at digitalcustomersuccess.com. My name is Alex Turkovich. Thanks again for joining and we'll see you next time.